continuing on slide 45. So um, the importance of um, signal intelligence, I want to briefly underline. This man you see at the bottom here, Zheng Shi Sheng, um, set up his operations in Jiangxi, and it was um, largely due to him, in part, um, and largely due to the spies that the CCP maintained at the center of Kuomintang military headquarters and uh, in the party itself that enabled the communists to survive. Um, up until recently, Chinese com communist propaganda has underlined how clever they were uh, and how stupid the nationalists were and all that sort of thing um, in order to account for why the nationalists were unable, <clears throat> excuse me, unable to um, to uh, annihilate the communists in their many attempts to do so. Those uh, four encirclement campaigns between 1931 and 1934. But a lot of the communist success in surviving was due to their espionage apparatus, which um, survived a lot of the purges um, and arrests, mass arrests of communists um, in the cities and within the KMT military as well. Um, a lot of people were found to, uh, to uh, either imagined to be <clears throat> pro-communist or found to actually be engaged in activities. And although the nationalists were kind of had a spy mania. They were, they were um, very concerned about being infiltrated by the Chinese communists and, and uh, probably killed a lot of innocent people who they assumed were communist agents. Um, there was some reason to be paranoid because the communists were pretty good at infiltrating them. Over the course of the revolution and later the civil war that followed World War II, um, the communists tended to have the upper hand, except for that period of 1931, 32, 33, um, when the nationalists almost annihilated them, almost destroyed them. They tended to have the upper hand in this whole espionage war thing. Um, and there was an awful lot of, um, of uh, you remember our Guanxi conversation from the, the uh, earlier this week, uh, the previous lecture. Um, this whole thing about Guanxi and uh, putting personal relationships first, this figured in heavily to this whole picture uh, where people's, um, the, the loyalties of, of many individuals to their party, to their military organization came after their personal loyalties to friends and relatives who might be on the other side of the struggle. Um, so Mao actually said in the 1960s that without this man, Zheng Shi Sheng, the Long March would have failed. <clears throat> Hyperbole, perhaps, but um, there's probably something to it. Later, after 1949, Zheng became the party secretary of Anhui, and in 1960, um, he had uh, faithfully carried out the instructions to uh, make steel in the countryside and, um, uh, and uh, uh, pursue excessive targets for agricultural production. And, um, and Zeng could see that these things weren't working, that there was a famine developing in his province. And so because Mao trusted him, he was able to convince Mao that uh, a retreat was called for, or he was able to help anyway, um, and it was partly by reaching down to leaders like Zeng that uh, Mao finally woke up and realized that there was this awful famine in progress all over the country, um, something we'll get to in a future lecture. Let's go on to slide 46. So the communists <clears throat> reached Yan'an, in late 1930, uh, really 36, but uh, they reached the area in 
late 1935. Um, it was uh, it was a bit later that they actually settled in Yan'an because the nationalists continued to control that particular city. Um, these pictures you see here are not actually taken in Yan'an. They're taken in a place called Bao'an. That's spelled B-A-O-A-N, Bao'an. But anyway, <clears throat> the um, the success in reaching this uh, sanctuary, which was out of the reach of the forces of Yen Shishan and Zhang Shreliang, was key to the communist eventual victory in 1949. Because it provided them some breathing room, they could um, rest their forces, uh, recruit local people. And this was the time when the popular dissatisfaction with the nationalist regime, because it was not resisting the Japanese, was at its height. And so a lot of people were proceeding, especially young people, students, were proceeding west and making their way to Yan'an to join the communist revolution. And it was during this period, after the enormous losses of the Long March, that the communists um, recruited tens of thousands of members. This later became a bit of a problem as um, the communists themselves became paranoid about infiltration from the nationalists. And indeed, the nationalists were trying their best all this time to recruit agents to send to Yan'an. Um, this led to a uh, particular, particularly difficult orgy of um, purges that we'll get into in our next lecture uh, in 1943. Anyway, um, it was also at this time that the communists developed uh, a more sophisticated propaganda apparatus. The propaganda department expanded a great deal, uh, and I should mention at this point that the core businesses of the Chinese Communist Party are, number one, organization, number two, propaganda, number three, military, and number four, intelligence. Um, these first three core businesses, organization, propaganda, and military, um, we'll get to in more detail later in the course. Organization means the organization department, and that's uh, basically communist HR, human resources. Uh, the organization department is responsible for uh, building party membership and organizing it into... Um, into sections, and when they're underground, into underground cells, uh, when they're ruling party, and they have territory and administration they need to uh, accomplish, then the organization department is responsible for assignments, and is an extremely powerful body. Uh, today, the organization department, as we will learn in the <clears throat> ninth week of our course, the organization department is uh, extremely secretive, uh, but it's like God. Its power is everywhere. I wonder if that would be with a capital G or a small g. Capital G. That's the organization department today in China. And the propaganda department, which I was trying to talk to before I got carried away, um, the propaganda department expanded greatly during this period and um, aided by people who had lots of brains like Madam Sun Yat-sen, Song Qingling, uh, the propaganda department uh, um, reached out to foreigners because what they wanted to do was to break the blockade that the nationalists had set up around Yan'an. Uh, they couldn't get all the way around Yan'an. Yan'an was uh, is in China's northwest, and it uh, is close by Mongolia. Who controlled Mongolia at this time? The Russians. But standing in between the Russians and the Chinese communists, uh, to some extent anyway, um, were Yan Shishan, the forces of Yan Shishan and uh, Jiang Shiliang. 
it wasn't uh, completely an unimpeded logistical route between outer Mongolia, only the Chinese would say, would think of this in this way, outer Mongolia, the center of Mongolia, anyway, um, it wasn't a completely unimpeded logistical route, uh, but it worked out pretty well going straight west from Yan'an um, into uh, in the great expanse of um, Xinjiang to the south and west of Mongolia. Um, the communists were able to, uh, to have a reasonably reliable logistical trail or tail back to the Soviet Union. Let's go on to slide 47. So as the Japanese threat became worse and worse in 1936, there were increasing calls, popular calls and calls from the elite to resist the Japanese by force. Chiang Kai-shek was not ready for this. And I have to say, <clears throat> he was no dummy. Because once war started with Japan in, in uh, September of 1937, or rather July of 1937, um, quite frankly, the Japanese whipped the hell out of the KMT. Um, and one overlooked aspect of World War II is that the Chinese nationalist side and the civilians under their control took enormous casualties in the period between 1937 and 1941 and 42, after the beginning of the Pacific War with the Pearl Harbor attacks and the Japanese attacks in Southeast Asia against British and French interests. So many people, stepping back now to 1936, were agitating for armed resistance against the Japanese, including Zhang Shui-liang, pictured here on the right. Zhang Shui-liang had uh, several communists on his staff, some of whom he knew were in, in uh, communication with Yan'an, some of whom he did not know were in that communication, including people handling his code books, just like in the old days in Jiangxi, when Mao Zedong and Zhu De were held up, holed up there, and annihilation campaigns one through four were going on, and the communists were on Chang's staff, stealing his code books, sending them to Yan'an, and Zheng Shisheng was uh, using those code books to decipher all these confidential messages that Chang was sending to his commanders, knowing exactly when and where the attacks were going to come. Same thing was going on at this time. <clears throat> and the, uh, the communists basically knew what Chang was up to all the time. Um, and so Zhou Enlai, was, uh, who was uh, one of the major leaders under Mao Zedong on the communist side, Zhou Enlai was working on Jiang Shui-liang personally um, through messages and, and uh, occasional meetings to convince him to, um, to come over. What they wanted really was for Zhang Shui-Lang to, uh, to um, defect and come over to the communist side, but he didn't do that. Instead, uh, he surprised everyone. He surprised Mao and Zhou. He surprised Stalin. And he surprised Chiang Kai-shek when on 12 December 1936, he decided to detain the Generalissimo when he visited Xi'an. Um, Chiang Kai-shek had come out to Xi'an to discipline Zhang Shui-liang because he felt he was insufficiently applying military force against the communists, which was true. Um, and so Zhang Shui-liang had Zhang arrested and walked in and, and uh, rather timidly, according to all sources I've looked at, um, requested Chiang Kai-shek to 
resist the commun resist the Japanese and unite uh, with the communists to fight them. Um, and this was uh, not Chiang Kai-shek's idea. Uh, he insisted that uh, that uh, he was not going to do that. He was going to make up his own mind. And and if uh, and if um, Zhang Shuiliang was a loyal follower, he would allow him to go. If he was uh, something else, then he should just go ahead and shoot me. That sort of thing. Um, lots of heroics. These were hard men. There's no doubt about that. Now uh, Mao thought that this was great. We can put the bastard on trial, and, uh, and in particular for all of the uh, killings of communists that had occurred up until that time. But when Stalin found out about this, he was horrified. He did not want China to be to be to split apart which would only help the Japanese, which might lead to Japanese, uh, uh, a Japanese uh, move against Siberia, the Russian Far East. He wanted China to be united and to continue to shed blood uh, to, against the Japanese and keep them busy so they would stay out of the Soviet Far East. I may sound cynical, but uh, this is, I think, the, the basic consensus amongst historians. So he telegrammed Mao and uh, ordered that they work to save Chiang Kai-shek, and Mao was pissed, but it was what it was. That's where all of uh, Mao's support was coming from, so he could stop his feet, but he had to obey. Um, and Chiang Kai-shek was eventually released in a matter of days, really. He convinced Chiang shui Liang to come back with him, to uh, Nanjing, where he was immediately arrested and uh, stayed arrested for the rest of his life. Poor Zhang Xueliang. Poor Borodine. Ah, well. Last slide. So Japan <clears throat> now is um, becoming more and more alarmed. They can see that uh, China is becoming United. Um, the negotiations which follow between the communists and the nationalists to unite into a second united front against the Japanese uh, proceed with Zhou Enlai flying back and forth between um, uh, Nanjing and, and uh, Yan'an on Chiang Kai-shek's personal plane. Um, but these negotiations don't proceed very quickly. Uh, over the course of the next seven months, between January and July of 1937, um, the talks go on and on and on. Um, but in the meantime, although they're not making very good progress, the Japanese are increasingly upset about what the future holds. And their military commanders start to become very aggressive in the field. The Marco Polo Bridge incident, now that's outside of Peking. You can uh, take a cab out there from Beijing city center in about an hour nowadays, unless there's terrible commuter traffic, um, and you can see the place. The incident that occurred, a shootout between two different units from the Japanese and KMT armies. Uh, by this time, the Japanese were on the outskirts of Beijing. Um, was at first settled by the local commanders with apologies all around, but, um, but uh, senior commanders in the region were less um, inclined to have any sort of settlement, and they ordered aggressive actions on the part of their subordinates, and this led to full-scale war and a Japanese offensive on all fronts against the Chinese nationalists. We will get more into that in our next lecture next week. And in the meantime, I wish you well. Hope to see you soon during office hours. And have a good evening, morning, afternoon, or whatever it is, whenever you're listening. Bye for now.